The Bible reading is Psalm 75, for the director of music, a psalm of Asaph, a song. We praise you, God. We praise you, for your name is near. People tell of your wonderful deeds. You say, I chose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the earth and all its peoples quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To the arrogant, I say, boast no more. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift up your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down, he exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. As for me, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob, who says, I will cut off the horns of, the, of all the wicked, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel reading is taken from Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So Lord, bring us again to the cross of Jesus where eternity is decided. Bring us to that point again where we commit ourselves to you and your truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do take a seat. Psalm 75 is on page 588 of the Bibles. I've reached halfway in the Psalms, 15 more years to go. And we'll finish it. Psalm 75. God says, I choose the appointed time. In the longing for justice, God chooses the time. Since October the 7th last year, Hezbollah, the terrorist group, has launched some 8,000 rockets and drone attacks at Israel. Uh, the plan was that this morning at 5 o'clock they would launch another 6,000 drones and rockets and missiles at Israel. But Israel heard about it. The intelligence networks worked right. And so at 4.45, 100 Israeli jets attacked the rocket launcher sites. 15 minutes to go. Timing is pretty crucial, isn't it, in these things? The judgment of God is good news in the Bible. 
And he is the one who sets the time. This is a psalm, of, a psalm about God's commitment to judge the world, to put things right. And it is a psalm framed by praise. You see that in verse 1? We praise you, O God. We praise you, for your name is near. When you see that phrase, your name, think Jesus. He is the name of the Lord, the one who acts on God's behalf. Just like um, when you see the language in the Old Testament of God's right hand. Again, think of Jesus as God in action. God's name, his character, is Christ revealed to us. We, we praise God that in Christ we told us what he is like. He's a God committed to justice. And verse 9, the psalm ends, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob, the God who keeps his promises. The judgment of God is good news. And this, the psalms have a bit of a, there's often little kind of a, a sequences of psalms where you see how one psalm uh, le- perhaps raises a question that the next one answers or things like that. So Psalm 72, which was the end of book two of the psalms, uh, with this kind of gone through lots of struggle and then finally there's a king on the throne. There's a king of justice. Psalm 72, uh, verse 1. Endow the king with your justice. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. When people are afflicted, they need justice to put things right. So Psalm 72 ends this crescendo. There is a king of justice coming. But then we, t- we move into book three of the Psalms and there's a, there's a longing for this justice because we don't see it yet. Psalm 73 is about looking at the arrogant, envious, rich, wicked, uh, the, the wicked who t- seem to be doing so well. And, and the Psalm writer is like, why am I following the Lord when those wicked people are just doing amazingly well? And he struggles with this until he realises, but... This is not the end of the story. I know where they are heading. But God is my treasure. So as an individual, Psalm, in Psalm 73, it's kind of, I as an individual, I am longing for justice. Psalm 74 is about a people longing for justice. When God's church is being trampled and oppressed, we pray for long, long, Lord, act Lord, revive your people. Come and act in this world again. And then Psalm 75 says, is come, God's saying, I will at the time of my choosing. You say, talking to God, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. There is a reckoning to come. There is a date in the eternal diary of God. Just because we can't see it now does not mean it is not real. And when God acts in justice, he brings justice and judgment on the world. It is to put things right, verse 3. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I, God speaking, who holds its pillars firm. It's like a house built on good foundations. And when there is a lack of justice, things are being shaken. But the point is, the world is built on justice. That is, God made this to be a world where justice has the final word. It's a world where God intends to uphold what is right and to get rid of what is wrong. That is good news. I've talked to a number of people who... Um, I remember talking to one person, he, the reason he became a Christian is because he wanted to believe that evil really existed. If there is no God, there's just what happens. Evil, it's not evil, it's just what happens. By what standard do you say there is evil if there is no God? I mean, we dig out weeds from our gardens, so we don't mind digging out things that are wrong. 
Why can't some powerful people dig out the weeds of people they don't like? Where is justice if there is no God? But there is a foundation to the world. There is truth. There is justice. There is right and wrong. Without God, you don't get any of that. But with God, we have a God who will uphold, hold the pillars firm when all else is shaken. So verses 2 and 3 give us kind of the foundation of the psalm. There is justice. There is a God who will put things right. And verse 2, that even the language of the appointed time, uh, the, the Hebrew scholars, experts tell me that there's a sense not just he will bring what is right, he'll do it at the right time. Let me quote one commentary. Everything about God's execution of justice will be righteous. It will come at the right time. It will be in accordance with his holy standard. It will be fairly administered. It will be unimpeachable. There will be no need for an appeal. There will be no danger of a mistrial and no possibility of corruption. Justice will be done because God will judge at the right time in uprightness. And so three consequences follow, uh, as explained by the psalm. First of all, do not boast. Secondly, God alone raises up and brings down. Third, the wicked will reap the consequences of their actions. First of all, do not boast. Have a look at verse 4. To the arrogant I say, boast no more. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. They're not talking about uh, brass instruments. They're talking about the, the, the imagery is of a, um, think of a powerful animal, a, 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 kind of a mean looking bull in a field with great big horns, looking like it owns the place and you're in trouble if you get anywhere near. Powerful animals often have horns. And so the idea is these arrogant people who kind of, their horns symbolizes their strength, the way they seem to rule things around them. And God is saying to the arrogant, do not lift up your horns. Do not rejoice in your strength, because I'm stronger and justice is coming. Apparently the language might be that of a ram in the herd that has subdued the other males in the herd and raises his horn in triumphant pride. Just think of that. If someone is pride and arrogant, what they do? Well, verse 5 says, don't speak so defiantly. Um, older translations are more literal. They say, do not speak with outstretched neck. So someone is proud, what do they do? They lift their head up, don't they? I'm, I'm better than you. You outstretch your neck. You look down at the others over there. That's the idea. Do not speak as if, well, I'm the best around here. I'm fine. Thank you very much. I'm in charge here. Do not speak like that. People wonder, is it arrogant to claim that God judges the world? God judging the world is the answer to arrogance. It's the answer to pride. If Putin believed in the judgment of God, he would not be so proud. So the psalm, first of all, is saying, there is a judgment, therefore, if you are proud, if you have an outstretched neck, I'm better than the rest. I'm the one in charge right here, thank you very much. Do not speak like that. Do not speak like that. Do not live like that. Do not think like that. Secondly, God alone raises up and brings down, verses 6 to 7. Verse 7 is a God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. Pride is the desire to up to exalt yourself. It's very instinctive human nature to try to work out the pecking order in any particular situation. You join a social group and instinctively, subconsciously often, we're quickly working out uh, who's in charge, what's the pecking order here. As an aside, isn't it weird how many psychological terms are to do with chickens? You ever notice this? Someone pointed out this to me a few years ago. Pecking order, ruffled feathers. Uh, who rules the roost? You're treading on eggshells, you're feeling henpecked. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, that's completely nothing to do with the sermon, really. 
But the point is, when people are proud, they're saying, well, I rule the roost, I'm in charge here. And God says, no, 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 I'm the one who raises up and brings down. God's verdict is the one that matters. In the uh, history of the Old Testament, one of the, um, one of the, one of the worst ever kings was, remember Ahab? Ahab and Jezebel were really bad king. Uh, Ahab's father was a king called Omri. He gets about three verses in the Bible. Omri was born, he was really bad, he died. It's basically what he gets. Now the archaeologists and the historians will tell you Omri was a really big deal. In fact, the northern nation of Israel, everyone else around it called it Omri land for quite a few generations. So historically, archaeologically, whatever, Omri was a really big thing. Three verses in the Bible is about all he gets. That's God's verdict. You're wicked, you're nothing. So who is on the right side of history? There's a phrase we get a lot. Who's on the right side of history? Well, God decides who's on the right side of history. God alone is the one who exalts or brings down. Can you hear the language here of... um, The Magnificat, later in the service, in the prayers, we're going to read Mary's song, the Magnificat. This is what Jesus came to do, to exalt the humble and to bring down the proud and arrogant. And that is what God will do in history at the end. He does it in smaller ways across history. You know, powerful people come to, they they get their comeuppance, things come home to roost. Sorry, another chicken illustration there. But God is the one who brings down or raises up. God's verdict is the one that matters. Who is on the right side of history? Well, the arrogant and the proud are not. No matter how much they exalt themselves. Because there's more to this life than history. There is eternity. After death, there is judgment. Hell is real. Those who go through life with their outstretched necks, with their defiant words, thinking they can exalt themselves, God will bring justice. But those who are poor, those who are at the bottom, those who have humbled themselves, God will raise up. 1 Peter 5, humble yourselves under God's mighty hands that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In our our worship, we humble ourselves as we confess our sin and then God exalts us and brings us to his table. We share in the royal bread and wine of the king king and the kingdom. We are exalted, having been humbled in confession. We are exalted to children of God at the royal table. God is the one who raises up, and God is the one who brings down. Third, the wicked will reap the consequences of their actions. Verse uh, 8, in the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. My visual aid... Here is some grapes from the Vicarage Vineyard. <laughs> They're a miserable bunch of grapes, these are. And there is a vine against our house. I um, don't know when it was planted. Daphne, do you know when it was planted? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, in Big Barnes' time, we thought of uh, Lizzie gave it to as a present. There we go. If you want to know the history of the church, ask Daphne. I don't know if it's ever produced good grapes. Um, has it ever? Well, then, are they... I don't think they're not um, They're not looking good. Have a look at these after the service. These are they're, they're small. They're kind of suspiciously probably mouldy. There's more seeds than flesh and juice in there. Um, I don't know if it's the vine, if it's our lack of care for it, if it needs feeding. I don't know what it is. But I, if I turn this into wine, I probably would not drink it. <laughs> I think it would be 
pretty grim. The, the, Caroline said, the, the bird's better eat it. It just kind of, it hangs on the vine, it just rots. That's not, even the animals ignore it. But that's the fruit. That is the fruit of this vine. He can blame nature or nurture, whatever it is. I don't know what's going on, but that's the fruit. There's only one sort of wine it's going to produce, which is a bad wine. The Lord brings the consequences of sin upon those who have done so. The fruit, the bad fruit of prideful, arrogant living is like the bad grapes on that vine. And God will take that and turn it into a wine. And those who are wicked will drink the wine produced by the fruit, the bad fruit of their choices and actions and heart. God harvests all the deeds of the prayer. This is another quote. The grapes their heart produces and God treads out the wine press, ferments the drink full strength and prepares the cup. Those who drink the cup down to its dregs have a full experience of the consequences of their actions. You can't escape the consequences of your actions if you live in arrogant, prideful, God-rejecting way. God will, has prepared a cup of wine made with the fruit of sinful action and the wicked of the earth will drink it to the bottom of the cup. Everything about God's execution of justice will be righteous. It will be the fruit of someone's own actions that produces this wine of God's anger against sin and judgment. The wicked will face the consequences of their actions. They will drink of the fruit of their sin. So verse, the psalm comes to an end. As for me, this is good news because God will uphold what is right in the world. God is the one who will cut off the horns of all the wicked, but the horns of the righteous well, shall be lifted high. And interestingly here, it's the horns, plural, of the righteous, singular. It seems to be implying that at the end of the day, there's kind of only one righteous person who will be lifted up. But we can be lifted up in him, the Lord Jesus Timing is everything. The judgment of God is good news unless you're on the wrong side. The issue is, humanity is on the wrong side. We are the vine producing that fruit. And it's not pretty. It's not tasty. It's not going to produce anything good to drink. Why do we... we, we the, the Psalms long for justice. Why does God delay... Timing is everything because God is giving us a chance now to be saved. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, fell to the ground and prayed, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. There is a cup of God. There is a cup of God's anger against the, the foul, fruitless, lifeless, bad tasting sin that humanity produces. There is a cup, but Jesus drank the cup for us as he hung on the cross. Take this cup from me, he said, yet not what I will, but your will, what you will, he said to his father. The consequences of our actions, Jesus drank to the dregs as he hung on the cross. The high and mighty God was brought low in death and humiliation. For you, Jesus drank the cup. For you, he took the consequences of our actions, our pride, our arrogance, our outstretched necks. 
He is the one who drank the cup to his dregs. The wrath of God was poured out and Jesus drank the cup for you and for me. So that now, while we wait for the day of justice and judgment, now we might come to the cross. Now we might come to the only righteous one. We come to him and we are made righteous in him. He drank the cup. He was punished in our place. He was vindicated, raised up by the Lord. And if we belong to Jesus, then we will be raised up righteous with him. Hebrews 9 says, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Jesus, for you, drank the cup. I've used this phrase before, but not for a while, I don't think. It's worth using it. I'm borrowing it from someone else. You are more wicked than you ever realized, but more loved than you ever dreamed. Judgment is real. The day of justice is real. But timing is everything. And God has already sent his son into the world to drink the cup for us. So when we drink from the cup of the Lord's Supper, it is a cup of salvation. It is a cup of joy. It is a cup of forgiveness. Because he drank the cup of wrath for you and for me. Let me end with this. How do we go through life? Do we go through life with outstretched neck? Thinking we're greatest around here, thank you very much. Others go through life with head bowed down, maybe caused by what others have done, or they know their own guilt, they know their own sin, they know their own arrogance, and their heads are, are bowed down. What are you? Where do you fall if you kind of drift? Where do you tend? Is it the, I'm a fine? Is it the, I'm lost? Psalm 4, as many places, describes God as the lifter of my head. God just says to those whose heads are bowed down, I'll lift your head. You are more wicked. Yes, you're more wicked than you ever realised, but you're more loved than you ever dreamed. For those who are outstretched necks, you're more wicked than you ever realised. But you're more loved than you ever dreamed. God lifts up our head with confidence and humility together because Jesus was lifted up on the cross and drank the cup of wrath so that we might drink the cup of salvation. Timing is everything. Why is God delaying justice? So that today we might call on the Lord and be saved. Let's pray. Lord God, we confess our, oftentimes our, our tendency to arrogance or pride, to live as if we're in charge of our lives. We confess also our, our longing for justice. We see the arrogant uh, seem to be doing so well. We see the oppressed struggle. Thank you that at the cross, You've proven yourself to be the God of justice and the God of love. To be the God of judgment who will cast out what is wicked and the God of mercy who offers salvation to the wicked. As we share in the Lord's Supper later on in the service, Lord, lift up our heads with, with confidence and with humility together. 
Help us to trust in the Lord Jesus and therefore to wait for his justice, but to preach his mercy to this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.